last week when some thoughts came to mind, preach out of here tonight. Psalm 119, if you find verse number 129. <coughs> verse 129, we'll read through verse 136. The Bible says there, Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore doth my soul keep them. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. I open my mouth and pant it, for I long for thy commandments. Look thou upon me, and be merciful unto me, as thou usedest to do unto those that love thy name. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of man, so will I keep thy precepts. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant, and teach me thy statutes. Rivers of water run down mine eyes, because they keep not thy law. And so I believe, and here we see the psalmist in his high regard for the Word of God. And, and all of Psalm 119 really speaks of the Word of God and His testimonies, His commandments. Um, my goal one day will be to preach through Psalm 119, just sections at a time. I, I enjoy reading through it. Um, but just kind of this, like I said last week, this, this portion stuck out to me as I was reading through here. And the, the prominence of the Word of God that the psalmist shows us. And so in thinking of that, I, have you ever received a trophy? And when we do our super kids graduations for our, our classes that we teach as police officers, um, everybody that wins as a class winner receives a medallion that goes on their neck. But the school winner gets a trophy. And so there's a difference between the class winner and then there's the prominence of the school winner. And that trophy comes with a expectation almost of excellence or a step above. And so in the idea, maybe we compete in a sport or something, we receive a trophy, and, and that it shows the excellence and the hard work we put into it. Uh, but many times, what happens with that trophy? We look at it with high regard, we're excited about it, we might talk about it for a few days, but eventually it gets set down somewhere. It gets put on a dresser or a shelf somewhere. And again, maybe for a couple months, we, we look at it, and it's, we get that feeling of excitement, and we understand what went into that but then it loses all value to us, don't it? And it ends up covered in dust, it gets put in a box, it sits in the attic, maybe it stays on the shelf, but it's just nothing but a dust collector. And so, the difference though, the psalmist here highlights, he assigns an elevated level of prestige to the Word of God. And in reading these verses, we sense that from the psalmist. And I want us to understand tonight that the Word of God applies to all areas of our life. And I think we can see that in these verses. And unlike a trophy, it never goes old. It never loses its value. It never goes away as long as we stay in it, as long as we continue to enjoy it. And so let's, that's the thought I want us to look at tonight. Notice in verse 126 with me, or I'm sorry, 129, he says, Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore doth my soul keep them. They are wonderful. The idea is that they're truly miraculous. We have the inspired Word of God in our hands tonight. We have the preserved Word of God in our hands tonight. And, and thankfully, we have it in our own language where we can sit and read it and understand it and grasp it for ourselves. And that's truly miraculous. And so I want us, let's look at that in that sense tonight. The prominence of the Word of God and how thankful we ought to be to have it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the night. Well, what a blessing already to be in your house. Lord, a blessing to be in America, to sit in a church tonight with the doors unlocked and to have the lights on and the air conditioning on and to leave here not fearing that the government would come in and shut us down, not really fearing much of anything, Lord, knowing that you're in control, uh, that you've blessed us, Lord, beyond that. Ultimately, Lord, we have eternal life tonight. And we know that we'll spend eternity in your presence. We have the word of God in our laps tonight, in our language, inspired and reserved for us. Lord, I pray that it would never grow old to us. It would never become like a trophy on the shelf that just collects dust. We might blow it off once in a while and, and show it off and put it right back. I pray, Lord, that daily we would be in the Word of God, that daily we would allow it to change us and to work in our lives, that it would always maintain its level of prominence in our lives, and that, that we would see its power, and that we would see 
uh, the proper response to it, Lord, as we look at this message tonight. Help us, Lord. We need your help. We need your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So verse 129, we see his testimonies are wonderful. Absolutely, truly miraculous. And so in saying that, they are wonderful. They're just full of wonder. They're full of amazement. Uh, as we read the stories in the Bible and as they're recorded for us, we just stand amazed at some things and how God works and how He worked in the lives of men. And, and as Pastor said often, they were just ordinary men and God working in their lives. There's no difference for you and I today living in 2017. We're ordinary men and women. We have the same life issues and problems and face the same struggles and we have the same God. And He wants to work the same way in our lives. So they are truly miraculous. If you would, verses we know. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Look at this with me. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The prominence of the Word of God. And if, if we understand what we have and what we hold in our lives tonight, if we would, I think, give it more value. We would allow it to have more value in our lives. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So they're given by inspiration of God. Uh, the idea that God Almighty breathed them out, or He breathed life into the Scriptures, uh, that alone is amazing. And, and the fact that He's giving it to us, He's written it, He's preserved it, and we have the breathed Word of God to us. They're profitable, the Bible says, to man. And it's through doctrine, through reproof, through correction, and through instruction in righteousness. Um, and, and again, that God wants to be involved in all areas of our lives. The instruction, the teaching, the correction and fixing. This uh, instruction in righteousness, how to live and how to be honoring to God. And the doctrine that keeps us within the lines in life. And that balance that we need to live. And so we see this... All because of, of an all-knowing God, an eternal God, that knows exactly what a human being needs today and has needed throughout the ages. And so then he, he wraps up in verse 17 that this man, this man of God, can be perfect or complete, the Bible says, um, truly enable him unto all good works. And again, we know ourselves. We know that we're sinners. We know the struggles that we have. And to think that God can use Scripture and teach us and bring us along to the place that we can actually do something for God. Do, do the work that He's called us for. And, and we preached Sunday about having a, a, a ministry and God calling each one of us to the ministry. And that refining of the Word of God that allows us to be usable, usable uh, in His work. And so, again, they are the inspired words of God. It's the breathed word of God. And, and that is why, one reason why it's so prominent, why it has that, that prominence in our lives. Number two, they're pure words. If you go back with me to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. Verse number five. Proverbs 30, verse number five. The second thing we see is that they're pure words. They are pure words. Proverbs 30, verse number 5, the Bible says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Okay, so every word of God is pure. He is the Almighty God. He is the pure and perfect God. And so in complete contrast to that is Satan who's called the father of lies. And he says here, add not, man, add not to the words of God, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. We don't want to be that way. And, and so we have to be careful that we stick with the word of God. We don't add to it. We don't change it. Uh, we don't take away from it. It is pure. And every word of God is pure. Uh, and to think again that we not only have an inspired Word of God, we have a preserved Word of God, we have the absolute words of God, and every single one of them are pure. And, and we can take that into our lives pure, unadulterated, with any type of, of what's the word? Uh, contain, contamination, right? It's absolutely pure. Every Word of God. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. And, and again, 
It's the absolute of, of trust and faith that we can have in, in God that loves us and has given us His Word. And again, listen, if we have to be in the Word of God to know who He is and to understand about Him that allows us to come to this thought and the grasp that He's a shield in my life. That it doesn't matter what I face in life. i got to drive home in the rain. He's a shield to me. I have to go search a building for a bad guy. He's a shield to me. I have to go meet somebody in a meeting and I need wisdom. He's a shield to me. I can pray and ask Him to help me watch my mouth. Help me to watch my thoughts. Give me wisdom in my responses. A shield to me in, in multiple ways. Um, and in different ways and, and areas of my life. And so I need to be careful. He says, get in the Word of God, know it, don't add to it, understand what it is. Okay? So it's pure. Every word, don't add to it. There's further warning, neither to add nor take away from it. If you want to turn with me to Revelation 22, uh, we'll look at that real quick. Revelation 22, verse number 18 and 19. The last book of the Bible, or last chapter in the last book. Revelation 22, 18. And verse 19. The Bible says, Therefore I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Again, just a warning from God that says what? This is my inspired word. This is the perfect word of God. It doesn't need anything added to it. It doesn't need anything taken away. Don't try to fix it. Don't try to change it. Don't try to make it sound better. Give it as it is. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. If you do, you get these plagues. These things will be added unto you. Um, and these things, he says, are written in this book. And, and so just again, it's a warning to us to be very careful. Um, we see, again, the, the many different revisions of different ways that man it just continues to put out Bibles. And, and again, if I want to take out somebody's foundation or I want to create questions, what do I do? I question the Word of God. And when I give you so many options and they take out certain things and this one changes that, and the further I can get you from the truth, the more confused you are, the less you know, the less you can stand on something solid and, and grasp it. Okay? And so it's all a ploy by Satan to, to just drag man away and to confuse man's mind and to get us out of the Word of God. And God's saying, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. It's perfect. Don't add to it. Don't take it away. It's pure. It's the inspired Word of God. And the third thing I'd like us to see under this point is that they're eternal. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. They're inspired. They're pure. And they're eternal. Matthew chapter 5. And verse number 18. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. Jesus Christ speaking. He says here in verse number 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And, and again, a reference to Scripture in saying that the heaven and earth will pass away before one jot. One little mark in the Greek or Hebrew, uh, the, a tittle was like a little accent mark. And he's saying the world will implode. The world will, will be gone long before the Word of God is ever proven to be not right. and Or before the Word of God is, is unaffected in our lives. Okay? So understand it's, it's inspired. It is the Word of God. We have it in our own language. It's, it's pure to us. It, it's spoken by God, and it's eternal. It's never going to fail. All else will fail before the Word of God would ever become untrustworthy. And when we can simply grasp onto that. We have the Word of God. And then, uh, look at one more with me. 1 Peter chapter 1. And then we'll quit turning so much. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse number 25. First Peter 1, verse number 25. The Bible says there, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. 
And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And so again, the word of God, and, and, and it's enough that he says it, it's endureth forever. And that means it will endure the test of time. It doesn't matter what the atheist say, the Bible says he's a fool. It doesn't matter what the humanist says, the Bible says he's wrong. It doesn't matter what some false teacher or any other religion would say. When it doesn't agree with the word of God, that person, that teacher, whoever it is, no matter how smart, how many degrees they have, they're wrong. And the Bible says it endures forever. That means it, there is no test that can pass. It will be around forever. It will prove itself in time and time and time to be pure, to be right, and to be true. This is the word, he says, by which the gospel is preached unto you. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. That saving gospel. And so you and I are not saved, the Paul would say, by the traditions of men and, and by thoughts and things that men come up with. We're saved through the Word of God and, and because the Word of God is pure and it teaches us salvation. This Word contains the gospel, the good news. Um, and stay here. I'm going to go back and I'm going to read you again verse number 130 in Psalm 119. So keep your finger there. The, in verse uh, number 130 it says, The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Okay, we're already at 1 Peter 1. Look at verse 23 with me. He says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Okay, so we see in, in, I believe, in verse number 130, the power of the word of God. So we have the prominence of the word of God. Now we see the power of it. The power that it can give eternal life. That it can change your life. It can, it can show you how to have eternal life. And when you grasp that in faith, it will change your life. There is no way that if you get the gospel and you get the word of God and you get it inside of you, that you'll stay the same. It's absolutely impossible. Okay? And, and we've got too many sissy preachers that want to be politically correct and don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And so they'll, they'll overlook all kinds of things. But if the word of God hasn't changed you, it hasn't gotten inside you. All right, okay? It's the power of the word of God that changes. And he says here, being born again, that's a new birth, that's a new me, that's a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Now listen, I, my, we have two boys, they come from my seed, no matter how pure or right or, or good I think I am, they're, in, they're corruptible. That seed that gets passed from me to them is corruptible. That's why I don't have to teach them to lie. I don't have to teach them to, to steal. I don't have to teach them to do wrong things. They're already got that corruptible seed. Yet when I get the word of God, it's incorruptible. It's passed from a pure God, a holy God, holy, holy, holy God. And so I have a pure word of God. And when I get when that word of God gets a hold of me, it's going to change me. Because it's an incorruptible seed. By the word of God which liveth and abideth again forever. It lives, it abides. That means that when I read it in the morning and I go to work and I meditate on it throughout the day, God already knows what situations I'm going to face today. God already knows where my faith is going to be tested. God already knows where I need to just step and trust Him. And He gives me exactly what I need. He allows that scripture to come back to me. It's alive, it's, it's, it's living. And it works in my life. And he says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides asunder the soul and the spirit. Because God, it's God's word. It's not man's word. It's not a, just a dirty book we put on the shelf and we pull out because I need some comfort. I need some words of encouragement. I need some wisdom. I need some counsel. Yes, it's all of that. Why is it effective? It's the living, abiding word of God. It's living. And, and, and so we need to give it the promise it deserves. It has power. It can change me. It can affect my life if I allow it. Okay? Being born of, again by the word of God, not corruptible seed, but incorruptible. It lives and abides forever. Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Not because Brother Sam told me a good story. Not because Brother Sam, he just got away and sharing the gospel. No. If it's going to change you, if you're going to get saved, it's because I took you to the word of God and I showed you what scripture says. You're a sinner in need of a Savior. Without Christ, you're going to go die and go to hell. You need to be saved according to the Scriptures. He died, he was buried, and he rose again, all according to the Scriptures. And that's what saves you.
when you place your faith and trust in that. Okay? It is the Word of God. It's the living Word of God. It's faith coming from by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18, the Bible tells us this, the foolishness of preaching. The preaching of the Word of God, again, that God has chosen to use to confound the wise. And, and I don't know about you, there's been times in my life, I got saved when I was five, so, so I've been saved. Now, I have the Holy Spirit living in me. But there are times when I've been away from God, and I haven't been as close as I should be. And, and I've sat there in the message and just been like, I wish you'd just shut up. It's 12.02, it's time to go. I wasn't enjoying the preaching because I wasn't, it was the foolishness. Just get it over with. And then there's other times when I'm in tune with God and the preaching of an hour goes by like that. And I'm like, he's done already. Why? Because the foolishness of preaching to the man that's sitting there like, I, I, this is, I don't need this. This is worthless. And, and God uses, and for the unsaved, they sit there and listen. I, I was listening to a guy this week. He was talking about when he was unsaved. And he would see a bumper sticker on a car. All it had to do was say a Christian radio station. Or it'd smile, Jesus loves you. And he said he would get so infuriated. Ah, it's drunk. Right? And he would just, it would just infuriate him. Why? Because they're putting a testimony out there for a God that is truth. And it infuriates those that can't take it. Okay? Right. And it's, it's that foolishness. Okay? But then he says, now I, I will have, in time I will save you. And, and the preaching now to me is, is sweet. And so I ask you, search your hearts tonight. If you sit here and it's just something you do and you endure it, yeah, you might, you, you're probably saved. You could be saved. Maybe you're not. That's between you and God. Search your heart. But maybe you're just not right with God. Again, get right with God. Allow the, allow the Holy Spirit, allow the Word of God to have His comments in your life. When things aren't right, fix it. Get it right. And then it becomes sweet again. All right, move on. The scripture changes a person's life. John 15, 3 tells us that we're clean, we're cleansed through the word. Uh, the idea of maybe like doing dishes, we put them in soapy water, and we, we wash them, and we rinse them, and we put them on the drying rack. And then he says in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy word, thy word is truth. And, and so that sanctification is a, a setting apart for a purpose, okay? We're set apart to do those good works for God. And there's some dishes that it just takes some, some light wiping and rinse it and you're done. There's others that it takes some scrubbing. And then there's those cookie sheets and those pans that you're just like, why should you leave these for me? <laughs> because they take that extra scrubbing, don't they? And, and so sanctification is a process. It's a, it, it's a, a process of time. It, it's that washing and washing and sitting under the Word of God and allowing the Word of God to, to change us and to cleanse us. And, and maybe maybe another uh, example would be some sandpaper. That maybe we've got a big knot and it just takes some rough grit sandpaper. And the Word of God knows exactly what we need. And it just keeps working away, working away at that big knot until God gets that smooth, softer. And then He takes that smooth grit and He just smooths it out. And if we're willing to sit under the Word of God, we're willing to allow the Word of God to keep working, it, it'll smooth us out. Amen. It's when we get hard and we don't want to change. And he gets out that rough grit and you say, no, God, leave me alone. So, okay. And we just, we stay hard and the foolishness again. Uh, so I understand it, that positionally we're sanctified already. The minute you're saved, positionally you're sanctified. It's a process, though, in this life of, of God changing us through the Word of God. Not just hearing the preaching once or twice a week or three times a week. Being in it daily and allowing it to work and change. He says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, the very God of peace sanctify you to change you, cleanse you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's just simply the word of God changing us, forming us into his image and making us what he wants us to be. As we, as we spend time in the word of God, it reveals our sin. It reveals God's holiness. And that's that gap that God's trying to bring closer. Make us more like his son, less like our natural person is, so that he can use us and put us in a position where we reflect who he is, not who we are, to conform us to his image. Then go back with me now to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Notice again, we'll read verse 129. 
He says, Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore doth my soul keep them. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for thy commandments. Look thou upon me and be merciful unto me, as thou usest to do unto those that love thy name. I, I think of men like Noah and Abraham and Moses, how God worked in their lives and the different things and responses God did for those men. And now men like David, maybe hundreds of years later, looking back and saying, God, I know how you worked in their lives, work in my life the same way. Here we are in 2017, we look back and say, God, I know how you worked in those men's lives. And I want your power, I want you to work in my life the same way. Sunday we preached about Elijah and Elisha. God, give me the power. Give me a double portion of Elijah's power. Give me a double portion of Elisha and what he had. Um, and we're only going to get it by, again, spending time in the Word of God and yielding to the Holy Spirit as He works in our lives. But we see these things here. And so a proper response, verse 129, because the Word of God is, is wonderful, because it is miraculous, um, he says, my soul doth keep them. The word keep is in a sense of, uh, I keep it, I obey it. But if you notice in verse 129, 134, and 136, that verse, that verse keep is there. Verse 134, deliver me from the oppression of man, so will I keep thy precepts. Verse 136, rivers of water run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. And so mostly there it's, it's speaking of obeying. I'm obeying because of I see the prominence of the Word of God. I'm obeying because I see the benefits maybe of obeying the Word of God. And oh, how it hurts when I see somebody not obeying the Word of God. Um, and he says that, verse 136, rivers of water run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. I, I can only think last night how many people were here for the piano recital and, and Pastor did, a, I think, an awesome job of using this, the verses, the music that was sung, um, relating that to the salvation message, the, the verse on the back of the, of the uh, program, and just really tied it into a good, just a solid gospel presentation. It was, it was uh, amazing. I thought it was awesome. And, but you know how many people probably sat there and that pastor, man, he's always preaching. And I come here to listen to my kid, and he's going to preach to me again. That, that's the foolishness of preaching, and God is tapping, tapping on people's hearts, and they've heard it once last night. Maybe they heard it earlier in the year. Maybe they heard it from their kid when they came home reciting scripture. God's tapping, knocking, and they're rejecting. They're only going to get so many knocks. And it's too late. Again, it ought to affect us. God help them. I, I, I just was thinking last night. God help those that will refuse to raise their hand and say, I'm not saved. I, I don't know if I die tonight that I would go to heaven. No, I'll go have refreshments and I'll leave here tonight. And I won't talk to Pastor McFarland. I won't talk to Pastor Phillips. I'll take another chance. And they may never get another chance. And the psalmist says there, because of what I know about the Word of God, because I know how it's changed me, rivers of water run down my cheeks. I weep, I mourn of those that can sit there with a hard heart and say, that pastor, he's going to give it to us again, and I'm not going to listen. And it ought to affect us. How about the Christian that sits here week after week, knows the Word of God, has been taught, has been raised in a Christian family, raised in a Christian school is saved. I don't care. I preach for preaching again. I know it's true. I'm not going to change anything. Hard. The response to the Word of God, and, and I thank you if that's you tonight, and your heart is hard, and you're, you've said no, and you've said no, and you've said no. Do something about it tonight. If God's knocking on your heart, say, I'm, I'm willing to give you another chance to get to the altar and make a change. Turn to me and change. Allow my word of God to change you. Do it tonight. Don't put it off. Because you don't know. You're not, you're not guaranteed your next breath. And you could walk out this door tonight saying, <laughs> never. Or you might walk out here and say, I'll take care of it later. And there may never be a later. You might get to Clark. And Claire Cone and Kobe or Silver Star, where Brother Frank got his crash. And it might be the last breath you take. You don't know that. 
Maybe you're laying in your bed feeling good and, man, it's, it was a good day. And you're not guaranteed that next breath. God can take it from you tonight. Don't, don't go home without making a change. Allow God to work in your heart. Allow the word of God to have its proper place. Paul used the same word in his instruction in Timothy. He said, oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed by trust. First Timothy 6.20. Timothy was not only to obey the Word of God, he was to keep it in the sense of, of guarding it, um, watching over it, not allowing false teaching, not allowing false doctrine to come in. And again, that's, that's our, our job tonight as a, as a good Baptist church, as having the foundation that we've had, having the Word of God, having a proper foundation been passed on to us. Here we stand tonight, moving forward, it's our job to also keep the Word of God and protect it, to guard it from false error, from false doctrine, from false teaching coming in and trying to change those things. That's our responsibility tonight. Um, like David and Timothy, we have the responsibility to actively obey and guard the Word, which means exposing anything contrary to God's pure Word. And, and last slide, I think we'll close after this one. Because the Scriptures, he says, because thy testimonies, verse 129, are wonderful, Therefore doth my soul keep them. The entrance of thy words giveth light and giveth understanding unto the simple. He speaks of these testimonies. And, and just in thinking, what's, what does the word of God, the pure word of God, the inspired word of God, the word of God that has power in our lives, what is it testify to us? Well, I have a list here about nine, eight, eight things. They testify of this experience. They testify of this eternal existence. In the beginning, God. Amen. In the beginning, God. Eternally, from eternal past to eternal future, He's always existed. He always will exist. The Bible testifies of that. Number two, they testify of His creative power. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not by forming it in sand and not by trial and error, but by simply speaking it into existence. They testify of His desire for fellowship with man. I think I'll create a man that can fellowship with me. Why? He needed me. <laughs> ha! He needed me. No, he didn't need me. He chose to fellowship with me. What an amazing thought. Amen. It testifies of God that creates beauty, creates uh, all kinds of variety. But yet he wanted to have a relationship with me. And he allows me to speak to him. Testifies of his hatred of sin and his eternal plan to redeem me, mankind, from the curse. Knowing that if I create man and I give him a free will and I allow him choice, he will choose sin over me and my relationship. And then I will be responsible to redeem him from that. I'll go ahead and create him because I want fellowship with him. I want that relationship. I want to allow him that free choice. And I'm willing to hang on that cross and pay that price. Testifies of his one for man and that he sent his only begotten son to die for your sin and mine. Testifies of his soon return to judge the earth and to ultimately reconcile Israel to himself. Testifies of our eternal abode with him in glory. And testifies of how you and I can be saved and reconciled to a holy God. Yeah. Because the scriptures are wonderful, they give light. He says he gives understanding. Um, the entrance of that word is life. It gives eternal life. It gives understanding, it says to the simple. That was me. I simply knew that I was a sinner in need of a Savior. At five years old at vacation Bible school, I got my knees and asked God to save me. Simple. I didn't know a lot. Still pretty simple. But the Word of God gives me understanding. It comes into my life and it changes me. And it makes me more like Him. And it gives me a desire to want to know more, to know more, and to know Him better. To share him more. And he says there, uh, notice verse 131, I opened my mouth and I panted, for I longed for thy commandments. So this strong desire to know and to have his commandments and to have the word of God. That deer that runs through the woods, Psalm 42, 1, he runs through the woods. The best place to sit up when you're hunting? Near a water spot. Why? Because the deer are going to get up and eat and they're going to go get water. That deer desires water. And he says, I pant. I open my mouth and I can't. And I think of our dog. She's so silly and she'll run around. And we can take
take her out and it's 100 degrees outside. You don't even want to be out there. But if you'll throw that tennis ball, she'll chase you again. And what she do? She comes back. And she lays on the kitchen floor. Like, you know, and you're like, what's she want? She's trying to get as much air as she can. She's longing for it. She's trying to get it in. And, and it's the same picture, the Word of God. When we know it, when it changes us, we'll long, he says the Word. And so, I, I, I pray that this, we understand that. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to keep you in longer. In what respect do we regard the Bible tonight? We're blessed to have the Word of God as our perfect guide for daily living. Amen. We ought to read it. We ought to learn from it. Most of all, we actually keep it. Obey it. Protect it. Bring it into our lives and allow it to work in us. And in so doing, we simply bring glory to God and blessings to ourselves. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want that? But we find ourselves, honestly, right? I might be able to preach to somebody tonight because I'm right with God and, and His Word is a blessing to me. But there's times in my life when I get myself out of, out of line and I'm not right and, and I struggle. Okay, so all of us end up there at times. But when we're in the Word of God, it, it, it simply brings glory to Him and blessing to us. And so spit with it. Keep it in its place of preeminence, its prominence. Allow the power of the Word of God to affect us and have a proper responsibility. Don't be like a trophy and set it on a shelf. Dust it off. I'm going to church Sunday morning. I got my trophy. No. Keep it in every day. Allow it to work for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the Word of God tonight. I'm thankful, Lord, to have a Bible in my own language that I can read. But not only do I have a Bible in the English language, I have a Bible that is pure. It's inspired. It's preserved. It's been breathed out by the Almighty God, the Creator of this world, my Redeemer. Lord, I'm thankful to be able to say tonight that I enjoy reading it and that I'm in a place in my life right now where it is prominent and it is a blessing to me. Lord, but I also know there's been times in my life when Sometimes I've just done it because it's what I do, what I'm supposed to do. Other times, Lord, I've had no regard for you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight as we start to search our own hearts, that your Holy Spirit would search us for. If we're not right with you, if the Word of God's not where it ought to be as far as confidence in our lives, if we have things that are wrong, and we know it because your Holy Spirit's working, and because the Word of God would tell us we're absolutely in sin, or we're not right with you, the Lord, we can get that right tonight. The altar's open, Lord, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would work. I invite you to come tonight if you want to come and pray. Uh, whatever it may be, we're going to stand and sing song number 40.